We ran into a horde of enemy fighters there. I did shoot down two of the uh, enemy aircraft. Another aircraft, enemy aircraft, got on my tail. I was born in Newport News, Virginia. My parents moved to New York City when I was two years old. And most of my upbringing was in New York City in the uh, borough of Queens. I uh, was to be drafted in the service, but I decided to volunteer, which was a prerequisite for becoming an aviation cadet and flying. So I volunteered uh, when I was 17 years old. I took the pre-qualification examination uh, and then uh, uh, I was called into the service in uh, March of 1943. Well, Tuskegee was, uh, was, was very good because the school that I went to uh, and did most of my training at were two areas there and they were nine miles from each other. One was Tuskegee University, it was known then as uh, Tuskegee Institute, which was an all-black school, and uh, the air base the uh, Tuskegee Army Airfield where I uh, trained as far as the flying was concerned, uh, that was 99% black at the time there. So uh, I did not, I did not, I was not victim to a lot of the segregation that would take place in other bases uh, because of the uh, circumstances that I was under at the time. We trained from the same playbook as the rest of the Army Air Corps there. There was no difference as far as the training was concerned for the uh, Negro soldiers versus the uh, uh, white uh, cadets. Uh, the training itself though was uh, arduous. It was uh, quite demanding. Uh, the actual flight training itself took place over a period of t 10 months and uh, was involved with three phases of flying. One was primary, which we flew a uh, fairly small aircraft, which was uh, about uh, 95 horsepower and uh, uh, two-seater and fabric. Uh, the second plane, if you successfully went through that stage, which was about two and a half months of flying in that aircraft, you went to what was known as basic. Uh, there we went to an all-metal aircraft, uh, 450 horsepower engine with a two-speed propeller and uh, a plane that was uh, more demanding as far as the flying was concerned. If you got through that two and a half months, you went to the final stage, which was called advanced. And advanced involved a, a very, very advanced aircraft called the AT-6, which was very much like a fighter plane. It had retractable landing gear. It had uh, all of the uh, accoutrements that you find in uh, most fighter planes there, however, it was not the standard fighter plane that was uh, to be, uh, that I would eventually fly during the war. I went from there for flying and introduction to the standard fighter planes of World War II and uh, flew the P-40 Warhawk. That was a plane that the Flying Tigers flew. It was the one that had that tiger shark nose on it. And then in uh, further fighter training, I went into another uh, contemporary World War II fighter called the P-47 Thunderbolt, and that was a uh, quite a powerful aircraft. It uh, was all metal, and uh, it had eight machine guns in the uh, in the wings, and it. Uh, uh, I got 80 hours in that, and then I went overseas, and it was at that time that I joined the all-black uh, fighter group called the 332nd Fighter Group, but properly known as the Tuskegee Airmen, and that's when I was introduced to the P-51 Mustang, of which I flew most of the models that they had at the time there. I flew the B model, the C model, and the D model. The D was the most advanced. 
I did get about 300 hours before the war was ended, but uh, uh, I found it a uh, delightful plane to fly, and uh, of all the planes that I flew, fighter planes that I flew during the war, it was uh, probably the premium fighter of all. My assignment was to go ahead and fly bomber escorts. Bomber escort was the principal uh, need to escort the bombers and to protect them from enemy fighters uh, sh shooting them down. General Davis was very strict about our escorting and protecting the bombers. Uh, some of the pilots and some of the other groups there uh, would take advantage of the uh, location that they were at and they would aggressively seek out the uh, enemy aircraft rather than protecting the bombers themselves, they would uh, advance themselves into territory away from the bombers there, creating a vulnerability as far, the bo as, far as the bombers are concerned. And as a result, uh, a number of bombers were lost as a result of the aggressiveness of, those, uh, of the fighter pilots there. Colonel Davis felt as though this would be very, very detrimental to the name of the Tuskegee Airmen or the group that we were flying with if we were to go ahead and lose some bombers as a result of wanting to go out and get some victory on our own there. So he said that uh, he would court-martial any one of his pilots there that went and left the bombers in order to uh, advance themselves as far as uh, shooting down enemy fighters was concerned. He said we must stay and protect the bombers. Uh, he was absolutely right or proven correct because as a result, out of the seven fighter groups that were bomber escorts uh, in the uh, 15th Air Force which we were in, uh, our group, or the 332nd, or better known at the time as the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, had the best record as far as the loss of bombers were concerned. The first mission was uh, was uh, a little strange to me. I, I, I had never quite flown in a, uh, uh, a plane, plane formation like that before. It was the first mission, of course, in the P-51 there. But we were escorting a large group of bombers. Uh, they were in hundreds as far as the numbers are concerned. And our fighter group uh, might have been uh, uh, 60 planes that were escorting a section of the total bomber formation that was in the air. Uh, however, uh, being, a, being a brand new uh, fighter pilot to the group there, I was flying uh, in a tail end position and I had a panorama picture of everything that was going on in front. I could see the bombers and uh, I could see a lot of the fighters, and as you notice uh, today, you can look up and an aircraft that might be flying at a high altitude may reach a, uh, a uh, uh, atmospheric uh, area where you'll see uh, white plumes coming from the plane there, known as condensation trails. And we used to get these condensation trails from the hot engines of all of the planes that were flying in the war also. The bombers had four engines, so they had four streamers or condensation trails that would be coming from them. And the fighters would have uh, one engine and uh, they would have a, uh, just a single condensation trail coming from them. But this panorama sight that I saw with these hundreds of bombers that were preceding me and the fighters that were circling over the bombers there. And it was a ballet in the sky as far as the streamers were concerned there. It was absolutely a sight to behold. And uh, it's something I'll never see again or that we will never see again because one bomber uh, today can do as much damage with one bomb as all of the bombs that were used in World War II. So there will be no need in the future for large armadas of aircraft that we saw in World War II. It was a unique situation for the time. We were on a mission to 
uh, uh, Austria, and we were uh, they were bombing a target that was not far from uh, Vienna. Uh, when the bombing was over, uh, of all of the fighters in the 332nd Fighter Group of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, that were escorting the bombers, there were seven of us that were designated to go on what was known as a fighter sweep, fighter sweep while the other bombers and other fighter planes returned home. A fighter sweep was just a uh, looking for targets of opportunity and to uh, destroy any ground installations or any aircraft that uh, might contribute to the Axis war effort at the time there. We were patrolling up around the Danube River and around Linz, Austria and we ran into a horde of enemy fighters there. And during the fighting that we had there, I, I did shoot down two of the uh, enemy aircraft. However, just as I had shot those two down, uh, another aircraft, enemy aircraft, got on my tail and was targeting me at the time there. Uh, I tried all sorts of evasive maneuvers to get away from this aircraft and uh, uh, the aircraft was uh, following me quite closely and I was diving down close to the ground to elude the aircraft and uh, what had happened was evidently the aircraft that was trying to shoot me down uh, went into a high speed stall and lost control and ran into the ground. When this was reported to the intelligence uh, when we got back to the or I got back to the base there they said well uh, you get credit for that third aircraft also because if uh, you had not outmaneuvered that plane there uh, that plane would still be flying so we'll give you for the credit for that plane also so as a result I was given credit for three aircraft. I think the training took over but it was stressful at the same time uh, I realized that uh, the planes that I was fighting against uh, were certainly capable of shooting me down and I had to be, uh, as, as at my peak performance at the time there and my life depended upon it and uh, certainly this uh, knowledge of that uh, stayed in my mind, especially when that third aircraft got on my tail and started firing at me, I, I thought that it was very possible that I might be hit at the time and become a uh, casualty of the, of the war. Well, you know, I looked at it as a uh, personal thing and I looked at it as uh, what, I, what we had done as far as the personnel were concerned on the bombers there. Every bomber that was saved or kept from being destroyed meant that there were 10 men who would get back home. Uh, we flew escorts for the B-24 Liberator bombers and the B-17 uh, Flying Fortress. <clears throat> Each one of those bombers had a crew of 10, which meant if that bomber were lost, it was shot down, that would be 10 men that were lost. So uh, for those that we didn't lose and uh, uh, we felt as though uh, this was a feeling that we had done a great deal in saving uh, the balance of those men who were flying. The uh, maximum number of missions that the fighter pilots flew over there before being returned home was 50 missions and I had gotten 43 so really I did not get to that top number of mi the missions that the fighter pilot would normally fly. However, the uh, second thought was being the war in Japan uh, was still going on and that eventually uh, after returning home I would be rerouted to the uh, uh, Asian theater of uh, combat there and I would be going back into the fight but this time fighting against the uh, uh, powers of, uh, of Japan. Uh, 
fortunately uh, for the country, uh, fortunately for me, and fortunately for probably the Japanese also, is that the uh, war ended with the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, as a result of that, I, I, I did not have to go to the South Pacific or the Pacific side of the war there. And uh, I went back home and spent the rest of the time in the service at uh, an air base in Columbus, Ohio, by the name of Lockbourne Air Force Base. Around 1948, the general of the Air Force, his name was uh, Vandenberg, General Vandenberg, <clears throat> decided that he would like to resurrect the games that they had, the war games that they had prior to uh, World War II. And uh, he ordered the Air Force, the 12 fighter groups that were in the uh, Air Force at the time in the continental United States, he ordered them to select three pilots from each of their fighter groups to engage in uh, war games which would involve uh, aerial gunnery at 20,000 feet, aerial gunnery at 10,000 feet, dive bombing, skip bombing, rocketry, and panel gunnery and that this would take place in the environs of Las Vegas, Nevada. Actually, the Las Vegas would be the host Air Force base that they had in Las Vegas, and the proving grounds or the weapons meet would actually take place in the desert about 40 miles away from Las Vegas itself in an area called Frenchman's Flats. But anyway, these war games, uh, the pilots selected, the three pilots from each fighter group were selected based on local competition that took place within their own groups there to select the three pilots to be the uh, participants uh, in the uh, uh, actually gunnery meet. Uh, as a result of the different planes that were flying at the time there, there were two winners to be announced at the gunnery meet at the time there. That was a conventional class, which involved five fighter groups who were flying the regular piston aircraft. And then there were additional seven fighter groups who were flying jet aircraft. And the only reason that they did not uh, compete uh, against one another is that uh, it was not apples to apples because the jets were not equipped at that time to fly uh, rockets, which was one of the uh, uh, demonstrations or uh, uh, games that uh, uh, we would play. So there were two winners. One would be the jet class and one would be the uh, <clears throat> reciprocating or the piston uh, engine class. Prior to going out to our flying out to Las Vegas to the host base, which was Nellis or uh, Las Vegas uh, Air Force Base at the time there, we were called in by the commanding officer, which was Colonel Davis at the time, and he was wishing us, you know, uh, well as far as the uh, uh, meet was concerned there, and that uh, he said it meant a lot to would mean a lot to have the Tuskegee win the meet there, and he knows that we'll put our best efforts forward, but I saw a smile in the corner of his mouth when he was saying that when he said, but he said, uh, if you don't win, don't bother to come back. And of course, that was a, a little wry, wry joke there. There wasn't much of a social intercourse with the other teams there, and uh, uh, the Full integration, even though Truman had uh, made the edict uh, some time before that, as far as there would be uh, integration, complete integration in the Air Force, there still was not complete integration, and uh, there was a little uh, coolness or uh, waywardness uh, as far as the uh, social aspects of the 
uh, meat was concerned itself. When the meat was all over, uh, they announced the winners, and the winner of the piston class was the Tuskegee Airmen or the 332nd Fighter Group. Uh, that was quite a feather in the hats of the fighter group, the Red Tails or the uh, uh, Tuskegee Airmen, because this proved without a shadow of a doubt that uh, when compared with the pilots in the rest of the Air Force there, they were just as competent uh, as far as their abilities were concerned. And that was the first United States Air Force fighter gunnery meet that took place in uh, May of 1949 from uh, May the 2nd until uh, May the 12th. Our winning of the 1949 fighter gunnery meet, uh, better known as uh, Top Gun there, uh, opened up uh, full integration or integration or was a precursor to uh, integration, full integration throughout the nation. The hotels that were not open uh, to uh, blacks are open to them today. Theaters, uh, uh, resorts, uh, uh, beaches, uh, any of those things. Uh, uh, a lot of schools which were completely uh, segregated by law. Uh, uh, were, are not today because of uh, that integration that started taking place and I think that the armed services was a great stimulant for that and that uh, uh, the winner of the uh, fighter gunnery meet was a uh, stimulant uh, as far as the military section of that was concerned. So I think in order I think that these things took place and uh, they all uh, were a precursor to the full integration of the nation as it is today.